needed in their success. So today's topic um, is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And so we have Matt and Marcus here joining us. And I'm not going to do the introductions because I wouldn't do them justice. So I'm going to leave it to them um, to introduce themselves. And we're going to walk through some questions that I will moderate. And then I'm going to open it up to our students in the classroom and to those joining us over Zoom uh, to open it up to some questions that you might have. So great. Any questions before we get started? Um, you can feel free to pop them in the chat if you have anything. Or Andrew and Warren, if you have anything, let us know. Great. So, uh, Matt, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll turn it over to Marcus. Your name, what your major was at Keene State, your graduation year, uh, your title, and your current place of work. Give us a little introduction of yourself. Thank you, Kristen. Yes, happy to. Um, so, my name is Matt Gill. I, my, my major was kind of interesting in that I did an individualized major, so, or an individualized degree, which meant that I had to apply for uh, and design my own curriculum. I ended up graduating with three concentrations of psychology, communications, and philosophy, but shaped into um, a degree I called human studies. So that is kind of what I graduated with uh, at Keene. So really interesting degree, but definitely prepared me. Um, my, my graduation year was 2010 and um, what I do now. So my role now, I'm the global head of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging for Allbirds, which is a company that centers around um, doing good for the planet through our products and through our in commitment to, to being a good company. So they're, they do shoes and apparel type products. So I don't, uh, but yeah, that's kind of where, I, where I'm at right now. Great, thank you, Matt. Marcus? Yeah, I'm Marcus Sutra. Um, my major at King was social science, um, but also at the secondary education. And uh, I graduated 2006. Um, yeah, and um, right now I'm the president of Eye to Eye, or we call me president and co-creator is my like full title. Um, but yeah, I've been with Eye to Eye since the very early days. Uh, we're an organization uh, that works, that seeks to empower students with learning disabilities and help improve their outcomes in school. Um, so I myself am someone who learned differently. So I've utilized my proximity to the problem, so to speak, um, and as well as my experience at Keene, uh, studying education uh, to help design and build eye to eye, uh, I've been with eye to eye since, uh, 2000, since basically right after I graduated when uh, David and I started the organization. Great, awesome, thank you both. So can we back up a little bit and talk about your career path and how it led you to kind of the pathway of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? And Marcus, I'm gonna just start with you and then turn it over to Matt. Sure, um, well, yeah, this is, you know, equity has been kind of the cornerstone of the work I've been doing for the last 15 years. Um, as somebody who, you know, went went through school labeled as dyslexic and labeled as ADHD, um, those were, you know, kind of negative identities um, for me as a kid. And then kind of was like, grew to understand them and grew to develop a community and the ability to advocate for myself. Um, I started to really think about this as more of a part of my identity and something I had pride in as someone who learned differently. Um, and it was really something that was going to help inform me as an educator. Um, so I my first... Um, First teaching job was, you know, after my student teaching at Keene High, I went and taught in Massachusetts and Connecticut, two different schools there, um, and really noticed that like my own lived experience was kind of this um, secret spy kind of moment where I was like understood those students so much better and was able to make my classroom more equitable, um, you know, use that empathy to really be able to educate students. Um, so yeah, so it's for, so giving students a voice in their education, I would say, is really how we kind of drive. Um, for greater equity within our school system. And um, yeah, so it's been kind of part of my life in, in various ways, um, really uh, kind of a faithful a day at Keene High where I told my story to my students and they responded positively and it really shifted the culture of my classroom is kind of what led me to, uh, to do this work. Awesome, thank you. Matt? Um, so... I had kind of an interesting path into the space. I would honestly say it started at Keene. So my uh, my first year, I I'm a member of the LGBTQ community. So um, I when I when I came to Keene, I really knew I was going to need to be out. I wanted to be out of the closet, and I wanted to be um, kind of who I was authentically. And that meant, and I also meant getting involved and meeting other people like me. And, and so I joined our student, our LGBTQ student group, uh, Pride, 
and and just started to meet other people like me. One of the opportunities that opened up was building relationships with some local nonprofits. So um, P Flag and Glisten had chapters in the region, and I ended up working with those organizations. So I started um, I doing panels and presentations with them, and then and just got more and more involved and engaged by the idea of educating and helping others feel seen. I think it centers around my want to be seen and so and and share who I was and, and, cur and create spaces where other people could do the same, right? where they could be themselves authentically. Um, and so that really led to be, I then was the, I, I joined as a president of Pride in my senior year and I founded Outspoken, which was a student group. I don't know if that's still around, but it was an amazing experience, honestly, that led me to my first role after Keen was, uh, Keen asked me to come back for a year and help start their multicultural student affairs office. And in that year I had done maybe 150 presentations around um, LGBTQ identity and how in um, diverse identities and how we show up differently and um, the importance of that work. So the I went off and after that I did my master's in education. I then did um, I was then like a dean of students for about three years in Rhode Island. Um, and then I, my partner started his PhD at Berkeley. So we moved out to the West Coast and I started looking for a new job. Um, and I left higher education and I got a role in corporate America. So I got a job at Charles Schwab, which was a financial services firm. <laughs> um, and I did education there. So my role was to design curriculum for our national events. And it was a great fit for me at the time. I did that for about two years. But in addition to that day job, I was always doing work in our organization. So in, a, in being companies, if you don't know, there's something called an employee resource group. So very similar to um, student groups, but in organ big companies, they have employee resource groups. So I led our LGBTQ employee resource group at my firm. And, and at the time, we just founded a brand new L uh, diversity and inclusion department. The, the head of that department reached, saw the work I was doing in addition to my day job and said, hey, Matt, do you want to join my team? So I absolutely jumped at the chance. So I joined the team leading employee resource groups, building community at the company. And I did that for about two years. And then I went off and um, they my role evolved and I became the head of diversity strategy for the company. So designing how our uh, company responded to diversity as a, as a whole. And I can go into that a little more later. But um, I then, uh, after that role, I joined my current firm, which uh, it all birds. So I, it was just an awesome opportunity to really grow with a company who was on a really high growth trajectory. So build a firm, build a culture, build a uh, build a, a point of view in our in the way that we serve our community and our customers as well. So that's kind of my path. It was really it started at Keen. Great. Awesome. We'd love to hear that. So you both have kind of touched upon this a little bit, but if either of you could expand upon kind of what motivated you to get, you know, in, involved in um, DEIB, uh, what, what really motivated you to do that? I know you both have personal reasons, but anything that you want to expand upon that and, and explain? Yeah, okay. sure. I, I, I think that the um, kind of Matt touched on this a little bit too, but um, you know, my story is, 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 is a component of it. And I think it was my initial kind of motivator um, just because I saw how I often use the analogy, like you have to put your mask on first before you can help someone else. Like that's what they always tell you at the, when you're on the plane. And it was the same kind of thing. When I found my voice as someone who learned differently and was able to take this invisible disability and, and use it as a way to help me inform me as an educator and a teacher and a leader, um, you know, I started to see how it benefited me and then how it benefited others around me within my community uh, and saw how much around like the invisible nature of this was such a struggle for us uh, as a community where people have to advocate and say like this is what I need to be successful you know we have an education system that's not designed for students who learn differently you know uh, and if you're a student who struggles with reading and writing and sitting still that's very very disabling um, and so like one of the great you know equalizers is being able to, to give students a voice um, so we do this in our programs. Um, one, we organize uh, mentoring programs around the country. Um, so we organize high school and college students. This is where my experience at Keene started. I organized the first IDI chapter at Keene um, back in 2006 uh, when it was just kind of a rogue organization with like four or five schools involved. It was um, it started at Brown and then it had gone to Dartmouth and Keene and a couple other places in the Northeast. 
Um, so we organize the high school and college students with learning disabilities to mentor middle school students with learning disabilities. Uh, and the curriculum is really focused on social emotional skills. So helping kids students advocate for themselves, identifying accommodations they need. Um, so really that, that that's kind of the core element of our work is that um, these students have their lived experience has been left out of the conversation and they don't have this empowering community to rely on uh, and giving that to them uh, creates a creates a system in those schools where students are able to advocate for themselves and it really normalizes the experience in so many ways. Um, so that's expanded now in our work um, where students are telling their story on stages. We've represented people with learning disabilities from events at Fashion Week to like, you know, events where we, uh, at the White House, um, you know, on, on con in Congress, we have students who go and tell their stories on Capitol Hill. Um, so yeah, so it's really evolved from this mentor model that started with me and a couple other uh, Keene State students at Keene, uh, uh, working in Keene Middle School, um, and really grown to, now we're in 25 states with that program, as well as training educators, um, but really all based on that, that, that principle of like, I'm going to teach you how to put, I'm going to put my mask on first, and then I'm going to help somebody else. That's fantastic. Thank you, Marcus. Matt, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, the only thing I, well, let me first by saying, I love the work you're doing, Marcus. Uh, like, I'm also dyslexic. So hearing- Oh, the awesome. Made, <laughs> just sound, it's just incredible. And I, I, I appreciate it. Um, but the, I would, the only thing I'd add is the, the evolution of my, journey over time has my motivation has changed a little bit i would say when i first started it was about um really showing up for my own identity kind of similar to marcus was talking about with the mask putting on your mask first right being seen showing up finding a space what i realized over time is how um if you look around <laughs> at Keen, you're you're kind of a homogenous community, right? So only through my growth and development did I realize about the amount of breadth of identity and the breadth of community that exists out there. Um, and the more I learned, the more I learned I didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. So it, my motivation over time started to increase around how do I make sure other people with different identities than me, with different races, different religions, different um, abilities, different uh, learning differences, right? Are, are How are they celebrated and seen? And I would say that motivation has changed over time, but it centers around that, that importance of creating spaces where people can be their authentic selves and show up in a meaningful, safe way. Thank you. So switching gears a little bit, I want to almost take a step back and, and talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in a little more general of a term. It's such a hot topic right now and, and has been for the last couple of years. Can you talk about some of the challenges um, that, you, that you foresee um, the, in that specific area? You know, what are some of the biggest challenges, whether it be in the work that you do or uh, the things that you may see? Marcus, I'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I think um, first off is, is, is not only making sure that there is, you know, there's diversity around the table, um, but that also everybody has a voice at that table. And I think that sometimes people are just saying, okay, we're going to get a diverse staff, but we need to make sure that everyone feels equal in that space and is able to, to lead the organizations forward. I think that's, that's one of the biggest pieces. And then recognizing your own blind spots, you know, as, as an individual. And that's something that, you know, I, I think about my experience as somebody with learning disability and like the, the privilege that I had in a way to know that I had a learning disability. Cause so many of the students that we work with, you know, don't, they're, they're like, they're not even diagnosed and identified, they're not able to get the supports. So just being able to, um, you know, be able to, um, to know that you have a learning disability can be viewed as a privilege, right? So I always, that's, and that's, that's kind of how I enter my work is thinking about like, how can we get more students to be identified to get the supports that they need? Um, but yeah, because the invisible nature of it for us is such a huge challenge. Um, but I also come back to that place of making sure everybody has a real voice at the table and you have to be thoughtful about how you do that. I think Matt would probably have best advice on how, on strategies and how that's done even, but. Thank you, Matt. So interestingly enough, I would say that this is one of the best times for DEIB and probably an, an incredibly challenging time in and of itself. Um, it, as you look around, right, we see more visibility um, for some of the, like, if you look at George Floyd, George Floyd, right, when you, when he was murdered, we had such a impactful 
um, meaningful moment of visibility, right? When we have our, the Asian community was experiencing, they've always experienced violence, but when it became really prominent in the news, right? We saw a, a, a groundswell of people who were motivated to see that. Um, and, and as much as that, all this violence has always existed, right? But the, the visibility into those spaces is getting greater. Um, with that, though, sometimes that also carries um, a burden to communities of color to, to, to carry and educate and support, and that can also be difficult. I would say one of the, I'll get into this if we go into this a little bit later, but I think that one of the most important things we can do as allies is just show up, right? It's just to be visible. It's help to carry the story. It's to help meet the challenge of being the educator and being the supporter and being the advocate. Um, and so that our communities, uh, that when for our, so our minority communities don't have to bear that burden. Um, it is, it, as much as it is, and, and we have this moment of divisiveness, right, to where we're, we're being more, more, not divided as much as uh, our point of view is very, is starting to become more varied and it's harder to break that point of view. <clears throat> making sure that we're taking steps early in our career, early in our development to build the skill set of, of connecting and communicating and learning about others and, and understanding their experience, I think will help with that. But it is a challenge today. It's a challenge of how we communicate, how we listen, how we build connection, um, and as allies, how we, how we are showing up, I would say. Thank you. So switching gears a little bit again, I, I want to take a back step. Talk to us about your time at Keene State. I know you both kind of said that in your introduction, but can you share a little bit about what you were involved in on campus, really how that's aided in your career path? I know, Matt, you've touched upon that a lot of your time here at Keene State. And, and same with you, Marcus, you're, you're working Keene High and be an education major. Just Can you talk a, li a little bit more about that or anything that you want to share with students um, about getting involved on campus and what your experience was like here at Keene State? Yeah, sure. Um, I had an amazing time at Keene. I mean, I not only did it give me my passion, but I also met my wife at Keene. Um, we've been together, we've been married, we've been together for about 16 years now. So um, I have a lot of love for Keene. I, um, I had a job at the library, which was ironic as a dyslexic to be in the library. I was already in the library a lot, um, but I chose to be the front desk person at the library as well. Uh, I got involved in, you know, um, you know, some, some intramural sports and things like that. Um, but then when I, when I graduate, when I was just right after I graduated we're right around the time I graduated I should say I got connected with a professor named Steve Bagai in the education department and um, I had this idea that I said it was like my first entrepreneurial kind of endeavor a uh, social entrepreneur and Steve and I said I want to start a camp for kids with learning disabilities and I just I don't even know how to like write a grant or do any of those things and um, Steve was a professor this was you know about a month before graduation I was thinking oh I'll be a teacher and have this summer camp um, potentially as a summer job. Um, I'd always been a camp counselor. Um, and so Steve really, I didn't know a thing about how that process went and how to like apply for grants and design the whole curriculum and all that stuff. Um, and I ended up getting the, a grant through Keene State to launch the summer camp. Um, and it started at Keene, uh, it was called Camp Vision. And then, um, and uh, we had maybe like 10 kids that first year. It was fairly small, um, but it grew and ended up being at other campuses around the country and kind of led me to, you know, taking that and it was a part of eye to eye and informed a lot of the, the curriculum design things we did early on. Um, but yeah, I think it was just that moment of like, you know, really developing a really a deep relationship with multiple professors and, um, and just saying yes to opportunities that um, I should, had no business <laughs> doing or being involved with and no, um, just really seeking out mentors, I think was the best thing that happened for me uh, at Keene. Great, wonderful. Matt? Uh, I would say Keen is, has such a fond place in my heart. Honestly, I, I, I think I grew so much as a person and um, developed so many skill sets from that experience. I was uh, probably as, as much as I cared about my, I shouldn't say this out loud, but as much as I cared about my academic experience, I cared just as much about my student, <laughs> student experience as well. So I, at that time, I was, I was the president of my class all four years. I 
well, I joined so many student organizations. I was a tour guide. I loved being a tour guide. It was a phenomenal experience. Um, and, and honestly, being able to build so many skill sets of, of how to lead a meeting, how to talk to people, public speaking. I would public speak and build skill sets um, around being open and being myself in front of other people was such an important thing to learn. I would say I learned academically, I learned about communication, I learned about how to influence, I learned about how we build, how we, how we change minds, right, how we, inf how we build connection with others. These are like the overlap, overlay of my academic experience and my student experience was so meaningful to my success today. I think the only advice I would give is just get in, like the, being involved in deeply around the things you enjoy academically and the things you enjoy as a student. If you can, if you can lean into those things, it will, even if you don't know exactly the direction of your career path, doing what you enjoy will make a difference and you will be successful because of it. Um, but yeah, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. you know, I think it's so important. Um, often students, or excuse me, often alumni return to Keene State or when they speak about Keene State, how much an impact Keene State has really had on them, not only while they are here as a student, but continues to have and really is the foundation for a lot of their success. So thank you both for, for sharing your stories. Um, so switching back to DEIB, you know, can you talk a little bit about for those students who want to be advocates, who want to get involved, but aren't really sure where to where to start or how to get involved? I know I'm jumping around in my question list a little bit and I skipped one. So if you're looking down at that, um, I'm jumping to the next question. So what are what's some of the advice that you have for those students who want to get who want to be advocates and not just really sure where to start? I can take a couple classes now uh, and it would be really, it really, I'm really jealous of the whole college experience and looking back on that met up uh, experience that I had. Um, but yeah, I think that, that that's a huge, that's a huge aspect of it is continue to educate yourself. And then I think there's really amazing nonprofit organizations that people aren't aware of that they can get involved in right out of school. Um, and I think getting that early job experience is so, so important. You know, um, I think that, you know, graduate school, all these things are, are really, really valuable, but getting that first experience right after college, um, doing an, an organization like City Year uh, is a great example where you can give a year to a city and work in the school system. Um, there are a lot of other service type organizations, AmeriCorps organizations that I think give students that firsthand experience. Um, which is so important. Um, and I know I, as a student, was often not looking into the nonprofit space, um, but, you know, looking on guides to our researching organizations, getting involved with them, volunteering, um, internships, anything, uh, any opportunities you can really grab to really, to get something on your resume and also just get that ex work experience and see like, is this the type of work that I want to be doing? And what aspect of this industry do I want to be involved in? Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's people who are doing fundraising, program design, all these different types of work. Um, so I think just kind of getting an understanding of how uh, an organization or school, wherever it is that you choose, you want to take your mission um, operates is a huge piece. Marcus. <laughs> no uh, problem. I, yeah, and I, I want to just echo what Mark, Marcus said a little bit in that I would say one of my, my easy, my earliest entry points was I said earlier was in two nonprofits. It was PFLAG and GLSEN. Um, being able to partner with those nonprofits, learn about our communities, build relationships and connections was an incredible um, part of building my skill set in, in this space. Um, I would say the, the other thing is just join a student organization that maybe you're not a part of. Maybe you're, you're not part of that identity community. Right. Like maybe you are, maybe you're neurotypical and able bodied and you join uh, and you joined our abilities group. Right. Um, maybe you're heterosexual and you join a our pride group. I think it's important to enter spaces that you in support communities really show allyship. Right. But then you'll lear learn a little bit about an experience that you may not hold. I think that's such an important part of about how you end, how you start this journey is just by learning, as Marcus really put it, Marcus put it in the center of reading, right? But I, I also would advocate for just, just talking and communicating and, and building relationships with people that are different than yourself. Um, so that, I guess that would be my advice. 
And 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 thank you for that uh, for that advice of how students want to get involved in this space. Any other general advice, and Matt, you touched on this previously. Any other general advice that you give to our Keene State College students that are on Zoom or here in the room with us today? What's some other advice that you may give, or that you would like to give? Oh, so many things thinking about. I'm trying to think back to myself as a senior. What, would, what should I have done differently or what could I have learned? I mean, I think that um, it's for me, it's been about so much about relationships and knowing what type of learner I am, you know, and like I think that everybody learns differently, right, whether you have a learning difference or not. And I think that something that I identified early on was that I learned by talking with other people, by seeking out mentors, um, and then that I that was a way for me to have experiences that I wouldn't have normally had inside the classroom. Um, so I think that just seeking out those individuals and really developing those meaningful relationships, um, I call it the nice people network. And I feel like my whole life, I'm just trying to grow the nice people network. Um, and that's, and that, that's just been an incredible experience that I've had uh, just coming back to like how meaningful community is and uh, how many people out there who are like, can be the right person to help kind of guide you onto the next step. Matt? Honestly, I think the thing I would, I would say, is, I would echo Kristen's point first, is that internships matter if you're looking for roles, right? So uh, in my last two firms, almost maybe my, my last firm, 60% of the interns we would, that would come to the company, we would pay and hire. <laughs> so in my current firm, I, we offered a job to almost every intern that, that worked for us. So I think it's important to think about internships in a meaningful way, I think is a great conversation to have. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, I think I lost my train of thought. Um, I, 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 yeah, uh, maybe come back to me. <laughs> Sorry. Any other advice that you would give to Keene State College students? Any other just general advice? I know Matt, you had said before getting internships, but also getting involved on campus um, and, and how that is so important. Uh, for, for, for students, for first year students, second year students, or even students who are about to graduate, getting involved in making those relationships and connections. Yeah. So. Yeah. We'll come back to you if you I, think of it, Matt. I'll jump in. I'll jump in off for Matt there. Uh, I'll give him a, th a minute. Um, I think that I remember an advice that I've still used to this day that I, I don't remember what professor said it, but I know that a professor said it. So I can't credit the person with this moment, but he said these two pieces of advice. It was in a lecture around going into student teaching and they were kind of like pumping you up and being like, you know, like you're making you feel like you were a Marine going into, <laughs> to going into teaching, which yeah, you do need to feel that way when you're 21 years old and have to stand in front, front of, you know, 17 year olds and convince them you're an adult, I think. Um, but he said, steal, steal, steal and stay out of the teacher's lounge. And I still remember that to this day. And it was like the idea of like, take ideas from other people, constantly like learn from others, you know, steal in like the positive sense. Um, and just kind of like, and then stay out of the teacher's lounge was kind of a metaphor for like, staying out of the parts of the industry that are convinced to do things the old way, you know? And like, I, I have to remember that was like a metaphor for like, oh, don't, if you, the teachers that are hanging out in there are like complaining about the kids and they're not focused on the, on the goals. Um, so I think just like trying to, whatever, you're, whatever industry you're in, there's a teacher's lounge, so to speak, mentality. And so um, just being open to new ideas because um, the, the only thing that is constant is change. And if anything, the COVID, leading an organization through COVID, um, you will really get used to change <laughs> and, uh, and understanding that you don't have all the answers, so. Thank you for, for giving me that space, Marcus. <laughs> I think it's a phenomenal point you just made. Um, but so the, I, I grabbed my thought again. The, when I think back to my own college experience, right, I, I don't think I talk about it openly enough is how much I struggled. I would say as a, as a student with dyslexia, as um, a student that was probably over committed in student organizations um, and probably less committed in my academics, I think I, I, when I graduated, I was a B student, right? The, that, what, and it was hard for me to do. I, I, I really, many a time, if I were to, if I were to look at myself now and say, would I get here as a college student? There was, in my mind as a college student, there would be like, no way, no way would I ever get to this person that I am today. I, I now have a master's degree. I'm almost, I'm done with my own doctorate. Like there's so much growth and trajectory I've been able to have. But if I look back to where I was, um, I think it's important to remember to, to, the advice I would give 
do the things that you're, don't focus on the things you're weakest at, focus on the things you're good at, right? There's a, some positive psychology around, uh, you can do some assessments called strengths quest or strengths finder, but it's all based on this idea that it's more important to lean into the things you're good at than to really try to overcompensate for the things you struggle with. And if, I wish I heard that advice sooner. I would say that because I've leaned into the things I'm good at, I, I've been able to be more successful. And I've just given, you have to just shed the guilt of not being the best at everything, right? Like, and it's okay that you struggle and it's okay that that challenge is a part of your life. Being able to move through challenge and come out the other side successfully, just every time you see a big challenge in front of you, like getting your first job or trying to get that internship, just remember every other time in your life where you have faced a challenge, where you saw this insurmountable hurdle, did you make it past it last time? And just remember that you probably the answer is yes, right? Probably you pushed forward, you made it through, you survived. And what's and then remember that for this time. Remember that there's this big challenge ahead of you. And if you can remember last time I survived this, well, I, you'll probably survive it again. So, so really it's important to remember that that challenge is part of your experience and to just keep leaning into what you're good at and just continue to push forward. Is the advice I give. <laughs> awesome. That was wonderful. Any kind of closing comments uh, before we turn it over to our students and those that are on Zoom for some questions? Any final kind of comments? Um, anything about DEIB or anything about Keene State, your experience here, your time here, career pathways? Um, anything else that you would like to share? No, I'm the one who's planking. I, I, can't. <laughs> um, I think Matt just covered it. I think I think that the, the, I just want to double uh, double click on the leaning into your strengths, and I think that that's something that um, I often thought that like uh, real learning was like just pure challenge. You know, it was like, oh, I'm taking this class because it's really really hard, and I'm going to challenge myself. And it's like sometimes leaning in, just leaning in on what you're good at, is just such a huge piece. And like that's something I've learned as an entrepreneur that you kind of you have to do, you have to surround yourself with people who have skills that you don't have. Right. Otherwise you'll never get where you're going. And um, so, yeah, so I think that that's just a, that's just a huge piece. And I think failure is another one, like learning from failure. You know, there's a phrase that I use, uh, joyous funerals um, that we use in my team. So like, let's say something doesn't go well, we failed a project, we don't get the grant, whatever it is. We say, all right, let's have this like joyous funeral moment, <laughs> celebrate this loss and let's learn from it. And I think that like that resiliency is, um, just so, so important, uh, even more so than really like the hard skills sometimes, I think, is that team members I've worked with who are just like resilient, can see that there's a problem and try and see through it, um, to Matt's point, I think are the ones that are, are the most successful and, and, and actually enjoy work the most, because um, that mindset, it can be so, it's hard, everything, you know, it's hard work. So, um, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be some wins, but there's also going to be a lot of, a lot of failures as well that you have to learn from. Thank you. So I'm going to turn to Bethany while others in the room have a question to ask. If Bethany has any questions or if she wants to read the chat, that would be helpful. I do not. I'm going to have to switch computers real quick because, of course, mine started to freeze on me. Thank you. Anyone that's on Zoom, hey, Mark, Misty, Sydney, anyone want to ask a question? You can feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask a question that you may have. Hey, why don't you jump in? Um, does is um, can you hear me well? I don't have my headphones on, and my mic doesn't always work really well. Okay, awesome. Um, so, as admissions professionals, we're storytellers. Uh, if you could each tell me your favorite story um, in in your in this current career or um, or any of the the other positions you've held, I'm sure you have lots of great stories. <laughs> Well, I can tell the story and it's also good. I'm going to work in a shameless plug for something too. So if that's okay. <laughs> um, so we, uh, there's this thing, I don't know if people know this thing called CNN heroes, um, but it's this honor that CNN does every year. The top 10 heroes of the year are announced. Um, and so, uh, but there's like a hundred heroes throughout the year and then 10 get to the top 10. And so right before COVID, uh, like two, literally like two weeks before New York shut down, I live in Brooklyn, New York. And we were, we, were work, we were working a school in Harlem, students that go to Columbia were mentoring middle school students in Harlem there, all with learning differences. And 
They called, contacted us and said, hey, we want to, you're, you're a CNN hero. Your organization's a CNN hero. My co-founder, David, was named one. Um, so we went to that school and filmed it and showed the work and all that stuff. And we're going to get ready. We're going to be on CNN. It's going to be amazing. And then the world shut down. And uh, we went in and, and they called us and they said, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Um, you guys, we're going to feature COVID people this year and we're just going to like the opportunities lost. So we were like, we all knew that we had gotten this, you know, award um and then it was taken away and so then we kind of just kept doing our work and throughout the pandemic shifted our you know programming to be virtual to reach students in new ways and um a year almost a year to the day they called back and said in 2021 and said it's official we're you guys are a hero again this year we're going to air this segment we're going to all this work that we had done a year ago was now and it was happening right in the spring as things when the rest of the world started to feel at least a little bit more normal um i know that was true here in new york and um and then we were just last week named a top 10 hero so my shameless plug is so please go to cnn and um vote for david flank my co-founder um that you can vote every day so vote early and often and then and in my time at keen you learn a lot about elections so i'm using that right now in <laughs> new hampshire so i'm using that skill to uh try and get us that that number one hero which will be announced on december 12th on cnn so um so yeah so that's congratulations it. marcus that's fantastic yeah so we it's very have metaphorical to, we have to get that out we have to get all that information out to our campus so everybody yes. goes and votes <laughs> Let's all right, was, I'm going to plug that then. Perfect. Yes, that's awesome. As I was going to say, Marcus, we'll connect because I think I have a couple opportunities to get it out there too. That would be great, yeah. Um, yeah, vote, vote, vote every day if you can. <laughs> Matt? Matt, do you have a story? Uh, I'm struggling. Um, I <laughs> would say, I'm trying to think about what's the best story to tell. Um, so, so I guess I'll share a little bit about a corporate, what, what corporate America is actually like <laughs> and uh, where you can make a difference. Um, the, when I first joined Schwab, Schwab was my first corporate in experience, right? And uh, I would say it was super isolating, right? Because everybody is, you're kind of a cog in a the wheel. There's 30,000 employees. Um, you're, uh, it's, it's important to try to just uh, just find, similar to being in, you're a freshman in college, just find your spaces, find where, where you were. And I started doing that, right? I started finding my spaces. I talked about my career path at, at Schwab a little bit already, but what I, I, what I would share, the story I'd share really centers around the importance of um, being, being, uh, being a storyteller, right? It's talking about how we, um, how we, how we, who we are. One of the, my first experiences within my first year at Schwab was because I was so involved in the LGBTQ community, um, they put me in front of the CEO and said, hey, uh, what's the LGBTQ experience? <laughs> and um, which is so, which is not, not what you should do, but it was, <laughs> a, it was a moment where I got to challenge and said, hey, why aren't we in certain spaces? Why aren't we showing up for our clients? Why, why, why don't our, our, why doesn't the LGBT community see themselves in who we are? Um, and it was a great eye-opening moment for him, and and being able to being able to help shape um, people's perception using your own experience and your own stories, and helping helping people really move forward is one of the best ways to make change. Honestly, um, so the at, at the end of, at, in my in my role. I was able through storytelling, through empowering our communities, we built a, a impact where at the end, at the kind of by the time I left Schwab, we I was running, we had a over over a million dollar budget. We were building investments into our local communities and every state in the country. We had we were driving impact for every identity community. Uh, in, in our different spaces, we, it was just such a meaningful shift in, in such a short period of time, using the power of telling and sharing who we are with, uh, with each other and, and really showing up. That, that power to influence and just, and just share uh, your identity actually truly does make change. Um, and it can make, it, it makes small amounts of change over time, but that, that really culminates to meaningful change 
and you can influence an entire an entire country, which is pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that great question, Pig. Thank you for the great answers. <laughs> Any other questions? Other students in here have any questions? Anyone on Zoom have any additional questions for Matt or Marcus? I do want to just say that Misty has been very active and uh, she has been saying some wonderful comments. Like as a fellow alum, this makes me excited to see the work that has both that both of you are doing and that she loves the Nice People Network. And also gave kudos to Marcus about the CNN Heroes news. <laughs> so, great, wonderful. Well, Matt and Marcus, thank you both so much for taking the time. We know how extremely busy you are. So we appreciate you so much taking the opportunity to give back to Keene State College and share about your career path um, and your involvement. So thank you, thank you so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it um, and, and thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you so, so, so much. much. Thank you to everyone on Zoom for joining us. Have a Thank wonderful you. day. Thank you. 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 Thank you.